How's it going folks? It's your boy Satoshi back at you with another video and today's topic is GDP, Gross Domestic Product, GNI, Gross National Income or GNP, Gross National Product, a lot of these different formulas for how to actually measure economic growth. Now I'm going to show you at some point in the video the top countries with the highest levels of GDP per capita which is also a concept that I'm going to discuss today for all of you that are interested in both economics and uh, you know trading or investing or cryptocurrencies. You have to know what GDP is if you want to be an active member in the market, uh, if you want to look at charts, if you want to make some deductions, or if you generally just want to learn more about how the world works. So economics, I love them, I studied them, and this is where I explain a little bit more about GDP to you all. So what is gross domestic product or GDP, right? It is by definition the total monetary or market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's borders in a specific time period. It is simply the measure of a country's economic health. Now it can be calculated annually, quarterly, and here are a few key takeaways before I go into a little bit more depth about what GDP actually is and what it's used for in uh, what's it, what its purpose is, right? So GDP provides an economic snapshot of a country at a given time, and it's used to estimate the size of an economy and its growth rate. GDP can be calculated in three different ways using expenditures, production, or incomes, which I will discuss a little bit later. Real GDP takes into account the effects of inflation, while nominal GDP does not. And throughout its in it, though it has some limitations, right? GDP is a key tool to guide policymakers, investors, and businesses in strategic decision making, right? So let's understand gross domestic product a little bit better, right? The calculation of a country's GDP has to encompass all per private and public consumption, government outlays, investments, additions to private inventories, paid in construction costs, and the foreign balance of trade, which is crucial, right? What is the foreign balance of trade? Well, it's very important because it is imports and exports, right? How much this one country is importing and how much it is exporting. If it's importing more than it's exporting, you can say that the balance of trade in the foreign account is in a trade surplus, right? If there's uh, more imports than exports, then there is a trade deficit. Some countries import more than they export because they have some other uh, different, uh, you know, benefits to them where they make money. So then it's, it's somehow even more worth it for them to import uh, rather than export. And I'm not going to give you examples now. This is actually a pretty important topic to talk about and I will discuss it in a further video. But in general, if there is a trade surplus, it is considered a good thing. If there's a trade deficit, it could be considered a bad thing. But, uh, you know, for example, the US is in a trade deficit at this point where they simply have a negative current account balance because they have the most widely used currency in the entire world, the US dollar. And it's more worth it for them to keep their currency most widely used while operating at a deficit in the current account rather than uh, you know, not having the main currency being used everywhere. So I'm, you know, I digress. We're going a little bit too far right now. GDP can be computed on a nominal basis or on a real basis. Real GDP overall is a better method because it takes into account inflation. And this is the US GDP in the past 15 years. So in 2008, it was 14 uh, trillion, I would say, right? 14,866 in billion. I don't know. It, it was huge, right? And right now it is uh, a lot larger. It is almost twice as large as it was back in uh, Q4 of 2007 because of the whole financial crisis back then. But in what's the, what's this period? Q4 of 2022, it was 26,000 billion, right? So whatever that number is, it's huge, right? Now the nominal GDP is the first type of GDP that we have on this list, right? Next to real GDP, it includes current prices in its calculation and also all the goods and services counted in the nominal GDP are valued at the prices that those goods and services are actually sold for in that year. It's very useful when comparing different quarters of output within the same year, but it's not so useful if you're comparing different years, different periods where inflation may have been different, right? Because if you make a calculation based on a certain price and then, you know, the price changes over the years, and you're making the same calculation, you're not gonna have data 
that is uh, absolutely unskewed, unbiased, right? The data is going to be a little bit skewed, which is why we use real GDP, right? It's an inflation adjusted measure that reflects the number of goods and services produced by an economy in a given year with prices held constant from year to year to separate out the impact of inflation or deflation from the trend in output over time. So what this basically means is that rising prices tend to increase a country's GDP, but it does not necessarily mean that there's more being produced, you know, or a larger income is happening or, you know, more is being exported or all of these things. But it simply uh, gives a measure of the GDP, uh, you know, nominally, right? So if you use a real GDP, you will have a much clearer view of what actually is happening in the economy, which is why most countries prefer to use real GDP when making these important calculations. Now, how is it used? Well, it's simple, right? You're given a reference year at the start, which is called the base year, and economists using that reference or base year can adjust for inflation's impact by using prices from this certain base year. It's quite simple, and the real GDP is calculated using a GDP price deflator. It sounds more complicated than it is. It simply means that the GDP price deflator equals nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100, right? To get a percentage out of it. It's very simple, and now you've learned something new. So if you enjoy the video, drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, right? Real GDP also accounts for changes in market value, so it's something to keep in mind as well. Now, GDP per capita is quite an important measurement, and it's a measurement of the GDP per person in a country's population. It basically shows how much economic production value can be attributed to each individual citizen, right? How much each person contributes to the economy and what is their worth in this economy, right? So it's very important to understand how different factors affect this current level of production of each individual in the economy. So per capita GDP growth is very important because you know, it's very well analyzed, it's very well thought out, and it's important to see which sectors are performing better to, you know, influence the real GDP, which sectors are performing worse, uh, which sectors are more efficient, which are more inefficient, how the unemployment is looking, and all of this different stuff and uh, all of these facts that influence the real GDP and especially GDP per capita, right? For example, if a country's GDP per capita is growing with a stable population level, for example, it could be a result of technological progressions, right? That are producing more with the same population level. So if you have the same population, but you see that the GDP per capita is growing, then it could be that technology is influencing this growth. Now, at the same time, if a country has a high GDP per capita, but a small population, it usually means that they have built up a self-sufficient economy based on an abundance of special resources, right? So let's look at the top GDPs per capita in the world, right? First one, Qatar. It has a $128,000 GDP per capita, uh, real, so this is purchasing power parity. Uh, the nominal uh, one is 61,000, right? Which is a uh, nominal is basically just not adjusted for inflation. And we have against the world PPP GDP per capita. It is at a large premium, right? So Qatar, Macau, Luxembourg, Singapore, Brunei, Ireland. I actually did not know that Ireland was this far up the list. It's pretty cool, right? We have Kuwait, Switzerland, San Marino, Norway, Hong Kong, United States, and you can check out the whole list right now. I'm going to drop the link below. It's quite interesting. And if you click on any of these countries, you're going to get some more detailed information about all of them, right? So quite interesting. Yeah, the GDP growth rate compares the year over year change in a country's economic output to measure how fast an econom economy is growing, right? It's quite simple. It's a, a good guidance for countries to know whether they should increase interest rates, decrease interest rates, because if GDP growth rates accelerate, it may be a signal that the economy is overheating, inflation is increasing, and central bank may need to raise interest rates. When did that happen? It literally happened before. After this entire, you know, scandal that happened in 2020, prices kept skyrocketing, the economy overheated, and what happened was the global, you know, federal banks, or sorry, the Federal Reserve of the United States and other central banks had to start increasing interest rates to uh, tell people, you know, save more, spend less to cool down the economies, lower inflation. But what happens? Well, it also decreases the GDP a little bit, right? Something to keep in mind. Purchasing power parity, right? It's there so that economists can see how one country's GDP measures up in international dollars compared to another country. It is simply how much 
purchasing power the money from one economy has in relation to another economy. GDP formula is quite simple as well. You have the expenditure approach where you have C plus G plus I plus NX, right? And what does this basically mean? It means C is consumption, G is government spending, I is investment, and NX is net exports or exports minus imports. And this is the formula for GDP or basically the aggregate level inside of an economy. All of these activities contribute to the GDP of a country. And for example, if we have that net exports are negative, but investments are positive, it's a good thing, right? Because, you know, they kind of cancel each other out, same as everything else in the economy. So the whole idea is to have as much positive here and as little negative without, uh, you know, increasing unemployment, increasing inflation and doing all of these things that will, uh, you know, induce a change in the real GDP. So let's say even if the net net exports are negative, if investments are large, government spending is good and consumption is at a normal level, it could be a sign of a healthy economy. Now, the production approach is quite simple as well. Instead of measuring the input costs that contribute to economic activity, the production approach estimates the total value of economic output and deducts the cost of all intermediate goods that are consumed in the process, like those of materials and services. And the income approach, uh, approach is income basically taken that is earned by all factors of production in an economy including the wages paid to labor the rent earned by land the return on capital in the form of interest and corporate profits gdp versus gnp versus gni for the end of this video gross national product is a measurement of the overall production of people or corporations native to a country gross national income is another measure of economic growth and all of these are used intertwinably gdp is the most widely used so it is considered the most important and that's pretty much all we need to know for this video. Now, just a little recap of the market. If the US 500 does end up breaking out of this level right here around the $4,200 mark, we could see a nice rise up into the 4.5K level. However, if it doesn't, and it is quite a strong zone of resistance, we could move down back into the FIB levels, right? Or, you know, potentially in the worst case, even down into the 3.3K level, because that is the uh, lowest point of support that we actually have, right? So that's pretty much it for today's video you've always got to have two different options on the chart because you got to stay unbiased and just wait for the price to tell you where the market is going rather than trying to predict it so that's pretty much for it, it for today's video if you guys enjoyed it drop a like subscribe to the channel comment down below lastly i'm not a financial advisor and you should do your own due diligence before investing into anything in the blockchain crypto or nft world and with that being said thanks for watching and i will see you all in the next video